So we're going to turn the tables today. I'm going to get to interview Peter Mansbridge, which is going to be a real pleasure. He's, uh, he's a friend. Uh, I admire him professionally tremendously. So the chance to talk to Peter about the changes in the business and also about the country because he was that voice. He was the voice of Canada, the face of Canada for so many Canadians. He's the guy you tuned to to find out what was going on for an explanation in times of crisis. He's also a big sports fan. And I think somebody who understands the links between sport, culture, and identity that are also part of the mix in Canada. He's always a great conversation. Whether, uh, whether you run into him uh, in a formal situation like this or whether you cross paths with him at a Raptors game. Peter's a, Peter's a fun guy to have a beer with. This is your office now? This is my office, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not bad, huh? That's great. That's great. Have a seat. Absolutely. So this is a one-on-one -on -one interview. It's a good, it's a good idea, that kind of show. Yeah, I, you should, you should have works. thought of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad to get to turn the tables on you a little yeah. bit. I, hey. this, is a, this is a real pleasure. Looking forward to it. What's, what's life like, you know, post, post having the most important seat in Canadian television? Yeah. I, like the beard. Like, I like you and Letterman. The fact that you and Letterman both grew beards right. as soon as you got off TV. Except he didn't stop growing. No, he did like, not I, stop. Like I, I stop every two days and sort of... But it is kind of a statement, back. right? Saying I don't have to. I don't free. have to do this. Yeah. I'm free. You know, when I when I first stepped down, I thought oh, this is going to be really hard. You know, I've been doing this for well almost 50 years, 30 on the national and 20 reporting before that. Uh, I thought I, I ain't going to really have trouble with this, but I didn't. You know, within a week, it was sort of being liberated in a sense. And, uh, you know, I still uh, love that job and will always say I love that job. But it gave me an opportunity to do other things and to think about other things and to get away from the kind of 24-7 grind that that job can be because you're always, like, you're always on. And, <laughs> and foolishly, you assume everybody else is too, that they really care about everything that's happening every minute. And most poor people, you know, live normal lives. And suddenly, I was sliding into a normal life. It so, was different. Well, what's that telling you? So, what, what were the things? Like, what, what, what was kind of on your list? What did you want to do the first day that you were liberated? Um, well, it's a funny thing about retiring. You're worried that suddenly nobody's going to ever call you or email you again. And as it turns out, a lot of people do right away. And they all want you to do something for them. And you are thinking, man, I better take that because nobody else may call. So all the people who call early are the ones who want you to do things for them for nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said yes to too many of those. I got a kick out of watching your election night because you know, being the guy at the end of the table, you know, not yeah. having the earpiece where somebody's saying, yeah, you got 20 minutes to fill because the speech is going to be like <laughs> stretch, stretch, stretch. <laughs> He looked as loose, loosey, loosey goosey yeah. at the uh, being one of the, just I, one of the one of the panel. Yeah, I uh, I really enjoyed that. That was another. You know, I I resisted the corporation when they first brought that up, and I said, you know, it's not fair. It's not fair to the new team. Yeah, not your gig anymore. It's so, not yeah. my gig, and uh, you know that's sort of all I know how to do. <laughs> and they said, no, no, no you got to try this. So I came and I actually really enjoyed it. What I was, you know, I was thinking about it. I knew knowing when we were gonna that we we're gonna get to sit down. Um, you know, the job you had, like I think about the job I used to do. Like I, I was, you know, I was the sports columnist for a national newspaper in Canada. Yeah. I got to go everywhere, see everything. Yeah. And that job, there's somebody doing that job now, but that job really is gone. The job, the way it existed, yeah. and newspaper sports coverage is going to be gone, and maybe newspapers are going to be gone. I, you know, I feel like I'm. You know, I was a, a, a buggy mechanic or something when, they, when automobiles came along. Um, do you, the job of, the, of a news anchor on a national newscast, do you feel the same way about that? Um, I'll always feel it a certain way because of, you know, the way I did it and the kind of position that that job ha had within the media and within the public. I mean, I grew up in the era of Cronkite, Huntley and Brinkley and it was Rather and Jennings and Brokaw. And I kind of slid in there, so it was still a big deal. But, you know, things have changed. 
um, and not just about television or print. You know, I talked to, um, I was doing a class at U of T and I asked the class, there were post-grad students, there were about a hundred of them in the room, and I said, I want to find out how you consume news and what your primary source of news is. And so I'm going to block it out, you know, television, radio, print, online, and any other form that you, you, uh, you uh, use to consume news. And within five minutes, I suddenly realized our world has really, really changed. There were very few uh, on the consume news by traditional print, mm -hmm. uh, hold, holding it in their hands. Um, there were also terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Cheers. There were, yes, absolutely. There were uh, um, very few consumed news by television or radio, a traditional way of you know, watching a, a, a screen or a television box. It's all this, right? Yeah. It's all this. And the danger here is it's okay if you know what you're looking at. You know, if you're looking at the BBC or you're looking at the New York Times or what have you. But most of them did not know what they were looking at. And that's dangerous. That's where things are changing. But for this job, for my, my old job, like your old job, um, the landscape has changed. And it's changing rapidly. And where it'll be within a couple of years, I don't know. I mean, audiences, traditional audiences, uh, have come down, not just in print, once again, but in television, all of them. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you know, there's a revolution going on in the information uh, age uh, that we're living in now, and it's not all good. I'm going to shift, let's say, I want to talk sports a little bit, but in sort of in the same context. Sure. Um, and I know, like, you, you, I know you followed the Raptors. You're a Raptors guy. Um, I'm a Raptors and a Leafs guy, which is an interesting person, yes. you know, so, yeah, position okay. to be. Yeah, here's so I, I, yeah, I've got season that. tickets, you know, for all those years where I had to work every night, I could never go to a game. And I used to, people thought I hated hockey because it bounced us around, but I actually had a monitor built into the desk so I could watch the games <laughs> right, while I was doing the show. Um, but now I have season tickets to both Raptors and the Leafs. So I see a lot of games. I'm also kind of still a hangover from my Western time. I'm a Winnipeg Jets fan as well. But I don't know where you want to go with this, but, I, but having those two different places to go to is interesting in light of a lot of the discussions that are going on about sport and the country. That's right exactly now. where I want to go. Canada! So let's talk about that. Like, first of all, watching from that point of view, watching that Raptors thing play out yep. last year, and watching as it crept across the country. You know, um, it was certainly you know, it's look, this team has been hugely successful at the gate from the moment they started. They have been incredibly well supported in the 4016 and the 905. They had there are basketball cultures within different parts of this country. But something else happened last year where that wave kind of crashed in places where it's never crashed before. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. What did you make of that? Well, I think a number of things played into each other. I mean, uh, you know, everybody loves a winner, and suddenly we were watching a winner develop and, and moving stage by stage towards a, a final goal. But it was also happening at a time where there were no Canadian teams left in, in the Stanley Cup, none in hockey. And so places the, in the country that were used to springtime kind of being involved in a, watching hockey. And so you had people who'd never even watched a basketball game before, suddenly watching a basketball game. You had people putting up basketball nets in their yard that never thought of doing it before, including in Tuk 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 Tuk, you know, kids uh, got a basketball net up. So I think there was, that was part of it. The other part of it is the country's changing. We the North is all over the world now. Yeah, this is the center of a global stage. 
and it's something we wanted to do. Um, we can attack the world from here, and we really believe that. And we're going to do it through basketball, we're going to do it through bringing people together, and we're going to do it through winning. Look, the mythology of this country and the mythology of hockey, which, you know, intertwined, it's a rural, small town mythology. Yep. Everybody in this country, statistically, is urban. You know, the, the vast, vast majority of people sure. in this country live in three or four party. or five big cities. Yeah, right? Like, like, yeah, and look at the map. Look at yeah. the electoral yeah. map. Yeah, exactly. But this is an urban country. It's not a rural country. It's not, you know, there's, there's a huge rural component to mm -hmm. Canada. But in terms of where people live, I'm not sure it's a shift. I think it's maybe just that was reflected in that moment finally where we said, actually, you know, this is not about people skating on frozen prairie sloughs. There aren't that many people skating on, but there's a whole lot of people in the middle of Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver or Hamilton or Ottawa um, playing basketball. Yeah, I'll push back a little bit on it because as you know, I live in Stratford, Ontario. You do. 33,000 people, southwestern Ontario, right in the heart of that kind of rural area that's bred a lot of the great Canadian hockey players. And some of the, the, including some of the current ones, just like in small prairie towns and this and that, they're still playing hockey. They're still filling boys and girls, still filling those ranks and still building ranks to accommodate the continuing growth of hockey in small towns. Um, however, things are changing, just like the country's changing. Uh, you know, when I go. And I got to be careful how I phrase this because um, I, I don't want it to sound wrong here. But when I go to a Leafs game, and I love going to a Leafs game, even <laughs> as painful as it can be uh, at times, when I go to a Leaf, Leafs game these days, I feel in some ways that I'm in sort of the old Canada, okay? The Canada we used to know. Um, it's very white, um, and you know there's a, there's a lot of people there who have strong views on various things that are happening in our country. Um, I go to a Raptors game. It's a totally different look. Well, it looks like we're in downtown Toronto here. Yeah. If you step outside, that's oh, what it yeah. looks like, right? And that's the new Canada. That is the new Canada. And you look in in that arena the Raptors game and it's it's crazy because in Toronto right same arena within 24 hours it goes from hockey to basketball right and yet and the crowds very different uh, and it's all good you know but it's different and this crowd that Raptors crowd is becoming more loyal in, in a true sense not just a hand-me-down from you know one generation to another sense, um, and uh, and um, uh, you know they they reflect a totally well I shouldn't say totally different but a different kind of view of our world than this crowd over here. And as I said, they you know they both have lots going for them in some ways, but this is this has kind of crept up on us. And, to go back to your point, I don't think we realized what was happening. Yeah, but I, it was happening. It, well, no, it was happening, and I. But and one, one threatens the other sometimes, or one feels threatened by the other sometimes. I sense. They can win three chips in a row. The Maple Leafs still going to lead the news. You know how it is in Canada. It's threatened by the change, threatened by the difference. You know, again, and not to just put it in sports terms, but although you know, hockey is always. There's a sense of kind of circling the wagons and protecting hockey because you're protecting culture. That's it's always you know you're protecting us if you protect hockey. Where yeah. it's ours, and you know I wonder about and you know look this is part of what sort of creeps out in the what happened with Don Cherry that idea of protecting that which people believe was ours or what they believe is authentic or what they believe is yeah. uh, organically Canadian or whatever you want however they want to put it and right. um, pushing back against the other. Yeah, I mean, listen, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say about that beyond what we've just said. Um, but it is, you know, it, it's clear to me that it is a different culture. 
you know, it's a very different culture between between the two. And at hockey, as I think we've found out in you know in the recent times, um, has some issues it's got to deal with that have been sitting there. And you know, we all knew it was sitting there. We all knew it. And yet we didn't do anything about it. We just sort of kind of accepted it. Oh no, but that's hockey, right? Um, hockey can learn from basketball. Hockey players can learn from basketball players. There are a lot of smart young men and young women in basketball uh, who understand it's more than just the game. In, in, a, in, a, you know, in a shifting culture, or maybe a culture that's already shifted, what do you think hockey's place is going to be going forward? You know, it's been so you know, tied into those ideas of identity. You know, the, like the great national question, right? Who are we and what makes us us, right? We, yeah. I, we I believe we've been wrestling with that one for a while. <laughs> yeah. But that's always one of the answers. Yeah, It's always it one of the answers, right? There's a, uh, I, you know, through all those, the era of all the constitutional battles, Meech Lake and Charlottetown, all that stuff, Quebec referendums, um, we used to, trying to understand who we were, you know, it was, as you say, the big question, who are we as Canadians? And we do these surveys and panels and polls and town halls, and, and we come up with great answers like, we love hockey. Yeah. You know, or, we're not American. You know, that's what we couldn't define. Well, that'd be one and that. two, probably, yeah, right? You know, right. and then winter. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, we, how, do we handle this? What's the place, you know, for hockey? Um, I'm a great believer in a country this big, this diverse, in everything, from its people to its geography to, you know, its resources. Um, it's a tough grind to make that a united country. It really is. Right? When we arrived in Canada in the 50s, my father, we were from Britain, my father used to say, well, look at this map, look how big this country is, look how diverse it is. It's almost ungovernable. Most people would look at that and say, you can't govern a country this big. Um, but we have this magic of Canadian compromise and they always kind of find a way. So if you translate that down to sport, um, you know, sport is a great unifier. It, 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 it really is, and we saw it. We saw it, you know, in uh, ten years ago during the Olympics, and how the country got united. We see it in hockey. We see it. We saw it in basketball. Um, we've seen it even in constitutional battles, where you think for a moment, my God, everybody in this country is doing the same thing right now. At the same time. Right? At the same time. Yeah. That doesn't happen often. In any, no, in any context, no, that's no. correct. And so that opportunity still exists. But it know, could be hockey. Bianca Andrescu that makes it happen, or it, it could, could be the Raptors be. that make it, it happen. Could it doesn't be. have Absolutely. to be. Absolutely. Or it could be a, you know, a Montreal-Vancouver Stanley Cup final. That would, yeah. Although that Toronto would divide. Winnipeg would be much better. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But, um, but there, there are these possibilities where you, you could literally be sitting in your living room knowing that in you know, every province in the country there are other people sitting in their living rooms watching just what I'm watching right now. And, uh, and that, that can be good. That can be a good thing. But, uh, yeah, look, that's my, my only argument for why sports matters is yeah. that collective experience. I don't have a better one. It's, otherwise, it's just, it doesn't. But that does matter to me. Uh, you know, for it to happen and for us to be lucky enough to, to see something like that, we do have to ensure that we can still cherish that sport. And, you know, once again, I don't want to overblow the hockey thing, but there are issues. There are huge issues, I think. And, uh, and they, they've got to be dealt with. Do you think that, look, I, I think in some ways it's kind of a calcified culture around that sport, but do you think it is fluid enough that it has the ability to reimagine itself and reinvent itself as a different, as not, 
I guess, as not what it has always been, because that's what we're talking about, right? That it has to be something other than what it has always been. Well, change happens, you know? Um, it takes leadership, it takes commitment, uh, but change can happen. And it can be for the good. There will always be those who will resist it, just like there were those who resisted you know, allowing Europeans to come and play hockey. Those who resisted visors. You know, it wasn't just Don. You know, there was, and there still are, those who feel that way. Um, so there's always going to be resistance. And that's where leadership, real leadership comes in. Um, and at what level that comes from. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I kind of watched that basketball experiment and I've seen what it, a huge role players have played, and sometimes to the uh, chagrin of uh, owners and, uh, and league officials, but they're, uh, they're players, I mean, in more than just on the court. Mm -hmm. um, they're not chattel. No, exactly. Um, and they're, you know, they're smart. You know, you watch some of these you know, LeBron's the TV executive now, as well as being a great player, and some of the stuff he puts out there is conversations between players. And it's really good. You know, they've got a lot more to say and to talk about than uh, just how to, uh, you know, throw a three-pointer. Hey, thanks for doing this. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, I, I say it was nice to sit on the other side of the table. <laughs> <laughs>